He's not just a song. He's the reason I sing. I have been blessed. I have been blessed. God so good to me. Precious are his thoughts of you and me. No way I could count them. There's not enough time. So I'll just thank him for being so kind. God has been good, so good. I have been blessed. God has been good, so good. I have been blessed. Our prayer focus. Today we are going to specifically be praying for addictions to be broken in the city of Louisville. Will you pray with me this morning, church? Father God, we come before you and we just ask, Lord, that by the power of your spirit that you would go forth over the city of Louisville, Lord, and that you would touch every man and woman or child that is dealing with addictions this morning, Father. We pray Psalm 91 that says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Father, I pray that your shadow would cover these individuals. Lord, I pray that they would turn to you as their refuge, Lord. I pray that you would begin to take off the blinders, Lord, that there would be light where darkness has persisted, that there would be hope where desperation has tried to take hold, Lord, that you would begin to break chain after chain after chain. Lord, we rebuke the power of the enemy over the people of the city of Louisville, Lord. We declare that there shall be freedom in Louisville, that there shall be hope in Louisville. Father, I pray that you will cover these people in their hearts with the feathers of your wings, Lord Jesus, that you will be their shield, Lord, that you will be their triumphant victory, that they will be able to declare, the Lord has saved me from myself. Lord, we rebuke this plague of addiction that has tried to take hold, Lord, and we declare that it has no authority, that it has no claim over the lives of the citizens of the city of Louisville. Lord, we are declaring hope in the name of Jesus this morning, Lord. We are confident in the fact that you can shatter every stronghold and every addiction and every barrier by the power of your name, Lord. So we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.
adoration and glory, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving us first of all. We take this moment to praise you. You are worthy of all of our praise. Jesus, we exalt you in the house this morning. 
we give glory and honor to the name of Jesus. And we declare unapologetically that there is one name to be exalted this morning. There is one name that is to be glorified in all of the earth, and it is the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So, Father, this morning we position our hearts to exalt your name, regardless of what is going on in our lives, regardless of what is going on in the world, Lord. You are still worthy of exaltation. You are still worthy of the praise and the adoration of your people this morning. So we exalt you in the house this morning morning, Jesus. You are the name that is above every name. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. You are the good shepherd over your people, Lord. You are the same yesterday and today and forevermore, and we exalt the name of Jesus in the house of the Lord this morning. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that we can call on the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, that we are not separated by a great distance from your presence, but that you are here this morning among your people, and we speak the name of Jesus. Lord, we speak the name of Jesus over Karen and Henry and Stephanie and Tay this morning. That you would overshadow their family this morning, Father. That you would be the Prince of Peace. That you would be the God of all comfort for their hearts, Lord, as they walk through this unforeseen season. Lord, that you would be the strength and the breath in their body, Lord, and that you would see them through this. Father, we pray for every physical need that is in our church this morning, and we speak the name of Jesus over it, Lord, that every sickness, that every disease, that every illness and cancer would have to bow at the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we have confidence and hope in you this morning, and we exalt the name of Jesus in the house, in the name of Jesus, the church said, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord this morning. It is so good to see each and every one of you on our first ever family Sunday. I shared a couple weeks ago in um, a sermon that the fourth Sunday of every month would become our family Sunday and that we would share a time of breakfast and fellowship before service started on those Sundays. So I'm so thankful for all of you that came out to be a part of that. It was so sweet to see the family of God this morning sitting around tables, sharing in a meal and fellowshipping with each other. And I, before I go any farther, I just have to recognize a very special guest that we have with us this morning. Sister Effie Nipper is in the house today, and we want to give her a round of applause and a great Church Alive welcome. This woman is a matriarch of faith for this church. She has been a pillar of this church for decades Um, And she is still faithfully serving the Lord at 103 years old. And that is such a testimony to the faithfulness of God over her life and Sister Effie's deep love for the Lord. So we welcome you, Sister Effie. We're so glad that you are in the house with us this morning. We're going to transition from our time of singing in worship to our time of giving in worship. And today, our giving is going towards the general fund of the church. And I wanted to share with you Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And this passage of Scripture says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. When the prophet Malachi shared in this, and it was pinned in Scripture for all time. He was speaking of tithe, and he was referring to giving God the first 10% of our income, the first 10% of our increase as a recognition of the blessing of God over our lives. And since Abraham met with Melchizedek and the tithe was first established, this 10% has always been given so that those who minister for the Lord and in the word would have the ability to pay for the needs that they have for their lives. An offering is what is given above and beyond that 10% tithe. 
These funds are what is used to take care of our building and our other needs. So when we come to this time each Sunday morning and we talk about the tithe and the offering, the tithe is that 10% and the offering is the abundance of what we give out of what God has blessed us. And for a long time as a teenager and a young adult, I felt like if I was tithing, that I was doing everything that I needed to with my finances. I felt this uh, sense of um, accomplishment that I was faithful in giving my 10% tithe every week. But the Lord began to work in my heart as a young adult in my early 20s that he wanted more than just the tithe. He didn't want me to give out of um, religious obligation, but he wanted to, me to give out of worship and out of the abundance of what he has blessed me with. And so this morning, when we talk about the tithe and the offering, God does not want us to ever give out of obligation. He does not ask us to give out of guilt, but he wants us to give out of the abundance of our heart in an act of worship. And so this morning, I encourage you to give in your tithes and your offering. And he has been so good to us. He has been so faithful that it is our joy this morning to be able to give back to him. We have four ways that you can uh, do that this morning as the ushers are coming. We'll be passing the offering plate through the sanctuary. You can also text 84321, and it will give you instructions for how to give online. You can go to our Facebook page, and the link is right there. Or if you're watching online, you can mail in your check with your tithes and offerings to our clerk and treasurer, Sister Judy Hatton. Will you bow and pray with me over the offering? Father God, I thank you for your faithfulness over our congregation. I thank you for your faithfulness over each and every one of our lives, Lord, and that we are a people who have been immensely blessed, Father. I pray that you would help us to find a joy and an exuberance in worshiping through the giving of our tithes and offering. And Lord, we specifically ask that you would take this financial gift into your house, Lord, that you would multiply it for the work of the kingdom of God, that lives would be changed, that souls would be saved by the ministry of Church Alive here in Louisville, Kentucky. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for your worship and giving. I invite you, if you have the ability, to stand this morning to honor the reading of God's word and to take God's word in your hand and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We are going to look at verses 16 through 36 this morning. And I want to speak to you on the topic of don't wait until morning. Don't wait until morning. Acts, chapter 16 verses 16 through 36. This is what scripture records. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten 
with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure that they did not escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. But around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed that the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your spirit that has already been with us here this morning in our worship. And I thank you for your word that is alive and still speaking and moving to our hearts today. Father, we invite you into this space and in these moments that follow, Lord, that as we dive into your word, you would open our hearts and our minds to receive exactly what it is you want your spirit to speak over your people today. Father, I pray that you would anoint me as your vessel this morning, that you would empty me of myself, and that you would fill me with your spirit, that I might be poured out before your throne this morning as an offering for you and for your people. We ask you to come and speak, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. When we look at this passage of scripture in the book of Acts, we are right in the midst of the ministry of the Apostle Paul and the establishment of the early church. Paul, who had once attacked and persecuted and sought to kill Christians everywhere, had been transformed by an encounter with Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. And his transformation was so radical that Paul was now spending his life as a missionary to the world, declaring that there was hope in Jesus Christ. Paul here is in the middle of his second of three worldwide missionary trips. Paul and Silas had reached the city of Philippi, where they would establish a church, and later Paul would write that church a letter that we now know as the Book of Philippians. It is in this ministry setting where Paul begins to be antagonized by a servant girl who is possessed with a demon. The scripture that we read this morning says that this possessed girl followed Paul and Silas around the city of Philippi day after day after day after day, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. And at first glance, that might look to be to the benefit of Paul and Silas, that there was a herald going all around the city telling people why Paul and Silas had come. But the reader can easily deduce that this demon-possessed girl was not going as a proclamation of hope, but she was following them as a sarcastic and antagonistic voice. She was mocking Paul and Silas everywhere that they went. Every time Paul and Silas tried to share the good news, this demon would rise up within this young girl and try to persuade people to not believe in Jesus Christ. And after multiple days of this, Paul becomes so exasperated with this antagonizing demon that he turns to the girl and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the demon leaves this young girl by the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And for you and I, if we were to experience that today, surely we would celebrate by the power of Jesus that had been displayed 
by faith and commanding the demon to leave. But that was not so for the people of the city of Philippi, because they had not yet truly understood this power of Jesus. And so the entire city becomes in an uproar, and they mob against Paul and Silas. And what Paul and Silas endure after that is being stripped and beaten and wrongfully thrown into prison for simply declaring the good news of Jesus Christ and casting out a demon from a poor, afflicted young girl. To be certain, this was not how Paul and Silas envisioned their ministry going in the city of Philippi. I don't believe that when Paul and Silas woke up that morning, that Paul looked at Silas and he said, well, today we're going to be beaten and we're going to be thrown into prison. Is that all right with you? I imagine that they intended to preach the gospel as they were, but that they did not fathom within their hearts that they were going to be beaten and imprisoned in that day. But that is exactly what happened. And in the midst of all of this, Paul and Silas made a most peculiar decision, as we read in Scripture, to praise God in the dungeon. You see, Paul and Silas are thrown into this dungeon after they have been doing the work of the Lord. Paul and Silas had not been going out through the city of Philippi breaking actual laws. They were not terrorizing people. They were not stealing. They were not murdering. They were not antagonizing anyone else. They were simply being obedient to the call of God on their life to share the gospel. And in the midst of this obedience, they are wrongfully imprisoned and thrown into a dungeon. They were humiliated because of their obedience. Yet still, when Paul and Silas find themselves shackled in the inner dungeon of the city of Philippi, I imagine that Paul begins to nudge Silas. He says, hey, do you remember that hymn that we were singing yesterday? Let's, let's sing it together now. And they would sing that for a few minutes, and then Silas would say, oh, that, that brought to my remembrance another song that we would sing. And perhaps they would take one of the Psalms of David, and they would sing it in that prison. And they began to worship God in the midst of their dungeon and their imprisonment. They did not allow their presence in the dungeon to discourage them from an act of worship. They had resolved within their hearts that whatever their setting might be, they would worship the Lord. And sometimes today, you and I find ourselves in places and situations that we never dreamed we would be in. These dungeons that we find ourselves in are not made of stone and chains today, but they feel like that oppressive, dark, and damp, and secluded dungeon. We find ourselves in seasons of life where we are asking the Lord, how did I get here? This is not what was supposed to happen right now. This was not the circumstance that I was supposed to be in. And we turn to the Lord and we say, I was following you. I was being obedient to you. I was sharing the gospel. I was being a servant for the Lord, and I find myself in this dungeon. Lord, why am I here? Sometimes we find ourselves in the dungeon as a direct result of our obedience to Jesus. You see, Paul and Silas never would have been shackled. They never would have been beaten. They never would have been imprisoned if they had first not been obedient to the call of God on their life to go to the city of Philippi and preach the gospel and the good news. So it leaves us asking the question this morning, will we worship in the dungeon or will we wait until morning? Job in the Old Testament understood this well. You see, Job was a man of faith and it came to pass that his family all died. His property was utterly destroyed by natural disasters, and his own body was afflicted with an illness that was severely painful and debilitating. Yet in Job chapter 13, verse 15, Job pins the words, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. 
Job was in a position where he said, I was being obedient to the Lord, and yet everything in my life still went wrong. But I trust God enough in the midst of the disaster, in the midst of the unknown, in the midst of the dungeon to still take on a voice and a posture of praise to say, God is still worthy of all of my praise, even when I am shackled in the dungeon, especially when I am shackled in the dungeon. God is still worthy to be praised. See, sometimes our faith is tested by our willingness and our obedience to praise God even in the midst of the dungeon. You see, it's easy to praise God when everything is going right. It's easy to praise God when the healing has come. It's easy to praise God when the family member has turned back to Jesus. It's easy to praise God when the job promotion and the financial increase has been given because we're living on the mountaintop. But it's not so easy to worship the Lord when everything has fallen apart and we find ourselves shackled in the dungeon and the devil is trying to steal the praise of God's people. Will we worship even in the darkness of the dungeon? You see, it would have been easy for Paul and Silas to become bitter in the dungeon that evening. They could have looked back at the Lord and said, how could you have let this happen, Jesus? How could you have allowed us to be so poorly treated and beaten and humiliated? God, we were just doing exactly what you told us to do, and you have allowed us to be wrongfully imprisoned in this dungeon. Why have you forsaken us? Yet that was not the posture that Paul and Silas took in that prison. That was not the attitude that they took on themselves when they were bound in this dungeon. They determined that they would worship in the dungeon. You see, there is a heartbreak that exists when the unexpected happens. And it seems as if we've been wrongly punished. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything to deserve this. I didn't sin. I didn't break any commandments of the Lord. I did everything that he told me to do, and yet I still find myself sitting in a place of anguish. But when we praise in the dungeon, we are declaring that even in the heartbreak and the unforeseen, that God is still good and that he is still worthy of our praise. You see, God's worthiness of adoration is not dependent upon the situation that we exist in. He is simply worthy of praise and adoration because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the creator that looked into the great chasm of nothingness, and he spoke order to chaos, and he created everything that we will ever experience. He is worthy of praise regardless of the season of life that we are in, despite what may be going on in our society. God is is still worthy of praise. But the people of God have to make a decision. Will we worship God only when we're walking in freedom, or will we still take on a posture of worship when we're bound in the dungeon? And scripture tells us that if the people of God are silent in their worship, that the very rocks that God created will cry out in adoration and worship of God because he is that worthy of praise. Praise in the dungeon, laughs in the face of the devil, and refuses to be silent, but to instead shout with a loud voice that God is great and greatly to be praised. But Paul and Silas also understood that praise precedes breakthrough. Praise precedes or comes before breakthrough. Verse 25 of chapter 16 says, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And I love the intentionality of Scripture because every word is placed there with purpose and for a specific reason. And this word, were, before the verb of praying and singing hymns to God is important for us this morning. Because where the word were here is, it's being used as a plural past tense verb to identify for the reader that more than one person had previously been engaged in the activity that is about to be described. So when it says that Paul and Silas were praying and singing around midnight, it identifies for us that Paul and Silas did not wait until midnight to start to pray and sing. 
Understand that this morning. Paul and Silas did not wait till midnight to begin worshiping the Lord, and then immediately the foundation of the prison was shaken and the doors were flung open. Paul and Silas had been in the dungeon for hours. Paul and Silas had been beaten long earlier in the day. Paul and Silas had been shackled by the stocks on their ankles and their hands for quite some time, and Scripture says that they were praying and singing, describing for the reader that their entire existence in the prison, in the dungeon, was one that was filled with prayer and worship. Oh, that is powerful for us this morning, church. It shows us that they did not wait until the moment of breakthrough to begin to praise God. And in fact, Paul and Silas had no guarantee that at midnight breakthrough was coming. It does not tell us that an angel of the Lord visited Paul and Silas and said, if you will worship God in the dungeon, then at midnight your deliverance will come about. Paul and Silas had no guarantee that they would actually leave the dungeon. It could have been that that was the end of the story of Paul and Silas. It could have been that the city officials decided to execute Paul and Silas. They didn't know what was coming in the morning, but they decided, while I am shackled in the dungeon, I will worship the Lord. I will praise him in advance of the deliverance. But also realize that the breakthrough was not why they prayed and sang. They prayed and sang simply because God is worthy of praise regardless of the situation. Paul and Silas knew that it mattered not that they were in the dungeon. God was still worthy of praise. They understood that it didn't matter that they had been beaten. God was still worthy of praise. It didn't matter that they had been shackled and stripped. God was still worthy of praise praise. And there is a disposition within the heart of believers that we need to attach to this morning, that regardless of the situation that we are facing, God is still worthy of praise. There is never a moment in our life where God ceases to be worthy. There is never a situation that we face that negates the holiness and the sovereignty and the magnificence of our God. He is and will always be worthy of of our praise, not because he might bring us breakthrough, but because he's simply worthy by nature of who he is. Oh, hallelujah. Paul and Silas did not know that the foundation of the prison would be shaken, but they praised him anyways. And too many times we want to pray in the dungeon but reserve our praise for the breakthrough. You see, notice that it said Paul and Silas prayed and sang. And your prayers can sound very different. We can pray prayers of thanksgiving. We can pray prayers of adoration. And we can pray prayers of petition and anguish. But worship simply ascribes glory and honor and majesty to the name of God. Jesus. So when they sang, they were taking this position of glorifying God's name despite their existence in the prison. This is not the only time where we see in Scripture that praise precedes breakthrough. Perhaps one of the greatest examples of this is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and the narrative of King Jehoshaphat, where Jehoshaphat had just become king over Judah, and he was reestablishing a right worship and a right practice of serving the Lord in the nation of Judah. He was tearing down the altars of Baal and the poles of Asherah, and he was leading the people in a revival of their relationship with the Lord. And it was not very long into his kingly reign that he got word that three nations were coming to attack him, that three nations that were greater than the nation of Judah had positioned to destroy him. And scripture tells us that he called the people to fast, to seek the Lord, and to worship. And Jehoshaphat's prayer can be found in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 6 through 12. And I just want to paraphrase for you what it says. Jehoshaphat gets up in front of all the people and he declares that you alone are O God, our God, 
You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. When we are faced with war, we can cry out to you and you will hear us. And when we don't know what to do, we can look to you for our help. And when Jehoshaphat did this, the atmosphere in the nation of Judah began to change. Scripture actually tells us that the Spirit of God fell on the gathering of the people as Jehoshaphat turned their eyes towards the Lord. And God responded to Jehoshaphat's prayer in verses 15 through 17, speaking through a prophet saying, do not be afraid or discouraged. The battle is not yours, but God's. You don't even need to fight. Just stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord is with you. So the next morning when the armies were coming against the nation of Judah, Jehoshaphat sent word to the army. And he said, I want you to step back a little bit. And then he sent word to the priests and the Levites. And he said, I need you to send me the musicians. I need you to send me the worshipers because they're the ones that are going to be on the front lines of battle. And I just imagine that everybody was looking at King Jehoshaphat and saying, you understand what you're asking us to do because the worshipers are not skilled in battle. They are not able to defend themselves. They have been in the temple serving the Lord and Jehoshaphat was resolved. We are going out to battle in worship. I understand that the enemy is coming against us, and it looks like they are greater than what we can handle, but we are going out in praise. And so he tells the worshipers that as they're on the front line to utter these words, give thanks to the Lord. His faithfulness endures forever. You know, it's not easy to be staring down three different armies and all of their battalions and their horses and their chariots and their spears and their swords and to just stand right there in front of them and say, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. But that's exactly what the worshipers did. And if one of them got a little bit discouraged, they would look at each other and they say, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And they would look at the enemy, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And as the worshipers worshiped God in the midst of the battle and in the midst of the attacking army, Scripture declares that the armies turned on themselves and they defeated themselves. And all the children of Judah had to do was stand and worship the Lord, say, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. There is something that happens in the spiritual realm when the people of God resolve within their hearts that regardless of the situation, we can stare the enemy down in the face and say, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Paul and Silas in the prison looked at each other. They said, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I know we've been beaten, but we will give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I know the doctor's report is is not hopeful, but we will give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I know the children's ministry room sits empty, but this morning we will give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I know that there is a lost and a hurting world around this church, but I declare that we will give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Praise precedes breakthrough. When the people of God will worship regardless of the dungeon, despite of the imposing army, we set the stage for the miraculous to happen when we choose to praise and not wait until morning. So I ask you this morning personally, what dungeon are you sitting in right now? What dark place have you found yourself in in this season that has tried to steal your praise? What situation are you facing that you've questioned God about and the enemy has tried to hold back your words of worship? I believe the spirit of the Lord wants to speak over somebody that you are to say, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I praise God this morning in advance of revival that will take place in this church. 
I praise God in advance of a packed out nursery and a packed out children's ministry room. I praise God in advance for the healings that we have been praying for in this church. I praise God in advance of the supernatural provision that I believe he is going to provide for this body of believers. I choose to praise God in the midst of a dungeon, in the midst of an imposing army, because he is worthy to be praised. If we look back at verse 25, we will realize quickly that it is not done teaching us just yet. For it says that around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. But then it says, and the other prisoners were listening. Not only says that Paul and Silas had been praying and singing, but they had caught the attention of those that were also in the prison. And I think it's fair to assume this morning that those other individuals that were in the prison were probably there for just reasons. Perhaps these were the murderers of the city. Perhaps these were the thieves of the city. Perhaps these were the worst of the worst that the city of Philippi had to offer. And they were so intrigued by what they were hearing coming out of Paul and Silas's inner dungeon that they stopped and they were listening to their worship. This is vital to our understanding of the text this morning because the praise that took place in the dungeon was not just for Paul and Silas. It was for every person who was in earshot of these two men of God who were chained in a prison cell. Every word of praise, every melodic note that they lifted to the Lord was a living testimony to every other prisoner in that jailhouse they were hearing the gospel displayed through the worship and Paul and the worship and the prayers of Paul and Silas even though Paul and Silas shouldn't have been in there and here these prisoners are they're listening to these two righteous men worship the lord and i wonder if they began to think well if they can serve the lord despite of not doing anything wrong yet still being in prison then perhaps there's something that i need to pay attention to if they can be so joyous and so worshipful in the midst of the dungeon, there's something that they have that I need to get a hold of. You see, Paul and Silas were turning their prison into their sanctuary. They were turning that dungeon into into the house of God. You see, sometimes we think that the sanctuary of God is just a physical location that we come to on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night, but God's house can be anywhere that, where the praise of God's people inhabits the room. So Paul and Silas took that dungeon, that place that had been reserved for pain and suffering and seclusion, and they turned it into the sanctuary of God Almighty. They turned it into the house of the Lord as they they began to worship him together. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 18 and 20, for where there are two or three gathered as my followers, I am there among them. Jesus is instructing us that we can turn any dungeon into a sanctuary. We can turn any dark season into a house of worship if we will position ourselves to praise God even in the midst of the dungeon. And notice the power of verse 26. It said, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. It clearly says that all of the doors immediately flew open, that every chain was loosed of every prisoner that was in that jail cell that evening. You see, the worship and the praise of Paul and Silas and their breakthrough did not just have an effect for them, but it began to loose some things for some other people that had not even yet learned how to worship the Lord. They had not yet understood how to worship in the midst of the dungeon, but because Paul and Silas were being faithful in their dungeon, 
dungeon situation to pray and praise all the way up until midnight. It had an effect on every person that was in the direct vicinity of them. Church, I'm telling you that when we worship God in our dungeon, it does not just affect us. It will not just bring breakthrough for us, but every person that is in a close vicinity to us that has heard us worship and praise in the midst of the dark season as God begins to bring us out of it and he begins to break the chains that have bound us. He begins to break the chains that have bound those that are around us and our worship and our praise has the ability to set the atmosphere for lives to be changed and addictions to be broken. Oh, every person in that jail health house that night knew that God had delivered them from their place in prison. Oh, hallelujah. I believe this morning that God is shaking the foundations of spiritual prisons by the praises of his people. That God wants to shake the foundations of the city of Louisville through the praises of his people. And that if we will worship God in every season, that he will begin to rattle and shake and to break some things loose that could not be broken by any other ability than the hand of God. But it relies on the praise of his people. Church, I believe that we need to let the office be our sanctuary. We need to let the loading dock be our sanctuary. We need to let the pharmacy be our sanctuary. We need to let the boardroom be our sanctuary. We need to let the nursing home be our sanctuary and our place of worship. Let the classroom be your sanctuary and your place of worship. Let the dungeon be your sanctuary as you worship God in every situation. You redeem that place as a sanctuary for God where his name will be lifted high. The scripture also testifies of the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. You see, Christ came to save all. Jesus came to free everyone. And so I believe that there is a correlation between what Paul and Silas experienced in that prison at midnight and what Jesus did on the cross. Because when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, he already broke every spiritual chain and he flung wide every prison doors that had been holding people captive by the power of death. And there was freedom for everyone. So when Jesus came to that prison in Philippi and he shook the foundations and he freed not just Paul and Silas, but every person person in that prison. It was a moment where the gospel could flow through Paul and Silas and say, Jesus loves you enough to save you right where you are. Jesus cares about us enough to come to the prison cell that we're living in by our own creation and to still free us by the power of his work on the cross. Not only did God release the prisoners, but he came to the jailer as well. Verses 29 through 34 say, The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before him. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. You see, as a result of their praise in the dungeon sanctuary, Paul and Silas not only got to witness to the other prisoners that were there that night, but they got to witness to the jailer himself. This jailer who had been set as a guard over Paul and Silas, and he had been instructed by the officials of the city, do not let them escape by any means. Even this jailer had surely heard the praise and the prayers that had been wafting through the hallways of that dungeon. He had been hearing Paul and Silas for hours worship the Lord. And when deliverance came to the prison, the jailer was not left out of that deliverance. It says that Paul and Silas got to minister to the jailer and that he and his entire house were saved because 
of the praise and the prayer of Paul and Silas in the dungeon. So I ask us this morning, what soul is waiting for you to praise in your dungeon? What jailer is waiting to hear your worship in the midst of your dark season? What prisoner is waiting for their chains to be loosed and their prison door to be flung open by the testimony of your worship in the midst of your dungeon? And this is where the title of my sermon comes into play. Don't wait until morning. Because I find this story fascinating for so many reasons. But one of the things that jumps out to me the most is verse 35 and 36, where it says, The next morning, the city officials sent the police to the jailer. Let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. You see, when morning came, the city officials were unaware of what had happened in the dungeon at midnight. They were oblivious to the fact that Jesus had come to the prison cells, that Jesus had entered every cell and he had opened every door and broken every chain. They didn't know what miraculous event had taken place the night before. And so they sent word, release Paul and Silas. And I find it interesting because at this point, Paul and Silas have already been freed by the mighty hand of God. In fact, they had been ministering all night. They had been ministering to the prisoners. They had been ministering to the jailer and his family. They had been free all night long. Yet God and his sovereignty included in the narrative of Scripture the reality that when morning came, the officials had decided that they were going to release Paul and Silas. And what this shows us as the reader is that Paul and Silas could have gone into the dungeon and just sat there all night long. And when morning came, they would have still been released. The city officials had already determined within their hearts, when morning comes, we're going to release Paul and Silas. But Paul and Silas didn't know that when they were sitting in the dungeon. They didn't know that when they were shackled by their hands and their feet. They didn't know that deliverance was coming in the morning for them. So they praised in the dungeon. They did not wait until morning. They did not wait until the word came from the city officials to release them to worship God. They worshiped him right where they were without knowledge of what would happen. And if Paul and Silas had waited till morning, they would have been released. But none of the other prisoners would have heard the praise of Paul and Silas in the dungeon. None of the other prisoners would have experienced the miraculous hand of the Father shaking the prison to its foundation and loosing their chains. If Paul and Silas had waited until morning, they never would have gotten to witness to the jailer and his family and his whole household would not have been welcomed into the kingdom of God. You see, Paul and Silas could have waited until morning. They could have waited until after the deliverance came to worship the Lord, but because they were willing to worship God in the dungeon, they experienced the miracle at midnight. Because they were willing to worship God while they were still shackled hand and foot, they had a greater opportunity to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so it stands as a declaration over the people of God this morning. We cannot afford to wait until morning. We cannot afford to wait until after the prayer has been answered. We cannot afford to wait until after breakthrough has come. We must choose to praise God in the dungeon, to worship him right where we are. I'm going to be asking you to stand all over the sanctuary this morning.